Um, I wanted to talk to you about an idea that um, has been, uh, been developed and continues to be developed in our office. First started back in 1988 when I was in school and read a book by Leo Marx called The Machine in the Garden. And in this book, he talks about this inherent conflict or proposed conflict between technology and the pastoral ideal in America. And he speaks about a young man who sits on a countryside hill and overlooks this beautiful landscape and hears the whistle of a train and realizes that for the first time, technology is going to invade his environment and destroy it completely and he'll never have that ideal again. And this really resonated with me personally because I grew up in an environment in the Caribbean that was full of lush uh, natural assets, beautiful little island, and then moved to Canada when I was 11 years old and then moved to the United States to go to school and I experienced a variety of different um, environments and conditions to work in. And so I find these inherent conflicts to be, as was just said, not deficits but actually assets. And so what we try to do in our work is we try to understand the interrelationship between technology and nature and we try to design our buildings so that we can support each other or they can support each other to their best and fullest potential, even when we're faced with things like buildings that are over a kilometer tall. Um, I give this example of an igloo as probably one of the most basic um, and simplest ideas of performance-based architecture. An indigenous material, a purposeful form, uh, well served to its use, no more than it needs to be, no less than it needs to be, great for wind, great for sun, great for cooking, and even potentially keeping those little predators out when that comes into <laughs> consideration. Um, and so Blair mentioned the Pearl River Tower, which was the last project that I designed when I was at SLM, over five years ago now. And this is where this formally started to kind of manifest itself, this idea that uh, form can really follow performance and really begin to inform a genuine language about architecture and beauty. Because I think most of the things that we find beautiful are things that are well made, well crafted, and are purposeful and useful. Um, we're doing a project now and one of the directors said that there's a real beauty in utility and I think that's very true. Um, Pearl is a 72 story, two million square foot uh, headquarters project in Guangzhou, China that was formed to bring the prevailing winds through the body of the building, actually puncturing the mechanical floors that you see up above and below, and accelerating the wind through what I call fuselages and, and increasing the performance of the wind turbines that live in those fuselages. We found out a whole bunch of things about this when we did it. It helped us to reduce the redundant structure in the building. The curve at the top of the building helped us to reduce the acceleration. And we learned a tremendous amount of things by investigating this architecture. Pearl is under construction and will open at the end of this year. And we took that project and we took those uh, principles to our new practice, which by the way is five years old, 10, 10 days ago today. So we're celebrating our birthday this month, which is really kind of fun. And we first did this project in Abu Dhabi, uh, Mazdar headquarters that Blair also referred to. Completely different set of conditions. But understanding that in this oven of a place where the ambient air temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the first thing we need to do is understand how to protect the building or have the building protect itself by shading itself, by having an exterior wall that was faceted, that was due east, due west photovoltaics, due north, due south, vision glass, increasing the daylight in the building and looking to have an architecture that brought the indigenous idea of courtyards and wind towers into the body of the building to create diffuse light and environments for people to work, play and learn in. In this particular case, for the first time, the relationship of structures and MEP, or mechanical, electrical, and plumbing became one expression. And the cone was literally formed to not just ventilate the space and create courtyards inside the building, but to structure and support the photovoltaic roof on the top of the building. And in this case, we learned that we could reduce the temperature of this space by about 21 degrees Fahrenheit without any air condition at the base, simply by understanding how to form the entries into the courtyards. And that was a lot of fun. And I don't want you to think that this is just about for the building's sake. We look at the performance of people and we are actually now through technology able to measure the comfort levels of people in their spaces regarding how they're dressed. So if we're in an indigenous area in the Middle East and people are formally dressed in their local clothing, that's one set of criteria. 
If it's a expat community, that's another set of criteria. If we're in China, if we're at a playground, and so, so forth and so on. And you see on the right-hand side of the slide, the blue or cool areas that describe the comfort areas inside the building. And on the left-hand side, the red zones that are outside the body of the building. All driven towards, hopefully, a performance criteria that describes a beautiful place to be. Um, in this case, the microclimate at the root top of the roof with gardens that grow uh, food, fruit, for the restaurants and for the inhabitants of the office building. Closer to home at Willis, we were asked to design this zero uh, energy hotel. And understanding the relationship between the existing building on the right-hand side of that image and this potential new hotel that the client wanted to be zero, we said, you know what, let's not do that. Because the issues associated with a zero energy building in this particular site didn't make a lot of sense. But what we did talk about is what we could do with the existing building to enhance the performance of the new building. And so in this particular case, we took 68 million kilowatt hours out of the existing building and converted it to energy savings for the new building. Turns out the new building only used about 25% of the energy savings. And so there became this dialogue with ComEd and everybody else about what do you do with the other 75% of the energy that you're saving in that building. In this case, the equivalencies you see on the far right are true. 68 million kilowatt hours a year in savings could be more than 10,000 single family homes off the grid every year. And so by looking at existing building stock in our city, we were able to tap into that latent potential, leverage that energy, and convert that energy for savings for everybody else in the room. Now everybody has a house, everybody lives in a building or occupies some building in some way, shape, or form. And so we're all active participants in this savings. And so it becomes this kind of multi-purpose, pluralistic approach to solving problems. It's no longer about just a singular individual acting on their own. It's really seriously taking cities and holistic approaches to solving problems. In terms of the relationships of performance, the existing building has particular characteristics that it creates in terms of wind dynamics around, it, around its base and around its top. Every time we plant a building in a city or on a piece of landscape, it changes the characteristics completely. And so what we learned is that we, by looking at the CFD analysis of the existing building, we can actually understand how best to form the new building so it performs better. And what we ended up with was this. And so the existing building actually informed the way that the new building was shaped and actually brought it to life. Literally, in a sense, gave birth to the new building and brought it online with no impact whatsoever. We took this idea and about a year ago spent about half a million dollars of our own money and did a research project called the DCARB Plan for Chicago. We studied 450 buildings, about 20 million square feet of existing building stock, and attacked every single subject that you see on that list. We published that book early this spring, and we have taken those principles and then broadcast them to other cities that we're asked to work on around the world. What we found was that by looking through the lens of a parametric model, we were able to, for the first time, look at all of the systems of a building together that you see on the right-hand side and describe the relationship between carbon, electricity, solar, all the metrics that exist in a building, and then in addition to that, look at all the buildings in relationship to each other so that we know what building A is doing to building B, what building B is doing to building C, and for the first time, look at a lens of a city as a whole as opposed to individual buildings one by one. So this is actually a planning tool. So you can plan for your 2030 challenge or plan for the, uh, the densification of your city by looking at a relationship across environmental and built systems. What we found was that we could infill the city and increase the density by 30% while still reducing the carbon by 50%. So density is good. And you heard Jeannie and other people talk about that. It is good. The question is, can you design in dense conditions in a valuable and a, a kind of quality of life way? And so we learn that by going around the world that we're experiencing the greatest crush of migration into urban centers, 60 million people every single year. And even when we're faced with the toughest requests from the clients, we try to find this balance between technology, environmental, nature, and the built environment. And so we looked at our great city, which we're being asked to design in Chengdu, China, 
That, ex that is actually the name of it. We didn't come up with that. That's what they call it. For 100,000 people in a development near Chengdu. And the generic is not what you want to do. It's, China is full of generic cities, faceless, um, undefined, actually imported in some cases. And we see it almost everywhere we go because we're really good at exporting our culture. The problem is it doesn't always fit everywhere that we go. And so we look at the dynamics of what we're given and what we're asked to do, and we develop these systems that structure a framework around how we want to build a city. And it's really a satellite city, which is another question for debate, because the, st the stresses on the infrastructure right now are so great that you can no longer expect to have the infrastructure that's there support this migration. And so we use CFD analysis and solar analysis to design the paths of movement, to cool spaces, to create courtyards, to define spaces for living that are consistent with the quality of life that they expect, not what we expect. We, just, we wrote a script for the solar gain on the buildings and identified all six million square meters, 60 million square feet of built environment to support the views and solar for every type, by every block, by every building. And what we did was we found that there was a simple little X showing up on every building that didn't meet the criteria. And so we either moved the building or shaped the building or formed the city until we had no X's left. And this is how technology can support these kinds of ideas. In the end, we were able to use one seventh the amount of land for this in development than we were for a typical city of 100,000 people. We used about 64% less water than an average city of 100,000 people and about 94% less waste. All ideas and proven from the work that we did at Mazdar, two and a half years of research by Dr. Chris Drew and a lot of people in our office who have been testing this idea. We're gonna transfer the land at the end of this month and we're gonna start the project next year. 48% less energy, all focused towards about 70% less carbon for this new city. We're doing the studies on the different typologies of buildings and building types from super, super tall, like the one I'm about to show you, all the way down to the single family home because we're really interested in understanding what it means when you build tall and build dense versus sprawl. And we're looking for metrics that describe this because we wanna know what the relationship is when you're in the middle. What's in between? What's the transformation between the single family home and the super tall or the super, super tall, such as Wuhan, 606 meters, 2,000 feet in Wuhan, China, all moving towards densification of first and second tier cities, all purposefully formed, all performing at extra extraordinary uh, energy and structural characteristics. And I'm gonna finish with this guy. This is what Blair talked about, over a kilometer tall more than two Sears Towers stacked one on top of each other. And what do you do when you're faced with that kind of language, that kind of need, or that kind of desire, when in fact you're trying to balance this relationship between nature and the man-made? And so we first looked at a series of diagrams, which are not showing up for me, that formed or extruded a tube and what that would mean in terms of a structure that was a kilometer tall, shaped that tube, extracted the fat out of it, reduced the structure, and created a building that was tapered for wind performance, and it basically the inverse relationship of wind forces to surface area. So obviously the taller it is, the thinner it gets. What we end up with is a profile that describes not just the structural but programmatic description of a super tall tower for views, energy efficiency, programmatic efficiency, everything else that would go into making a single expression of one building. And we know that the carbon footprint of these buildings are far superior than building a thousand units over across 20 or 50 acres of land. We know that. What we have to do now is figure out how to make these buildings great for the quality of life and experience that we're gonna try and uh, execute. And I'm gonna try and show you the animation that wraps this up, and I don't know if it's gonna work. Let's see, it's not. But I'll leave you with that quote. Thanks very much. <laughs>